Hey, Deep Chatters, I'm Leah Morris here with my co-host Jennifer Butler, and this is Deep Chats Podcast, where we have raw discussions about real life. Each week, you can expect unfiltered, no BS conversations from the heart about topics that actually might matter to you. We're just a couple of relationship coaches who want to cut through the small talk and dive deeper. So thanks for joining us on this journey, and be sure to subscribe to the show so you never miss an episode. Hey, Deep Chatters. We are back. Hi, Leah. Hey, Jen. Good to be back. Good to be back. I know. I know. I'm so excited. It's like this new year and there's this new energy and I'm just so excited to be launching this and um, just kind of impacting as many people as we can. So, Yeah, me too. And it, you're right. There is like a new energy here. I think that It always happens regardless of like how the last, you know, month was of the last year. I always feel this when you get into January, like, okay, a little bit deeper breaths, like, okay, we got to pace ourselves. Let's look forward. It's more hopeful. So yeah, yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy to be in this space and also to be working on the podcast and like actually having it be out. I know. I know. This is so exciting. So We actually mentioned this, I think, when we did our first episode, our little intro episode, that we really want to be interactive with our um, with our audience and welcome any input or questions or topic ideas or anything like that, Um, because then you and I can tackle it and or try to tackle it, but talk about it, right? Like model what a conversation about it would look like. And so we received our first question, our first email. Um, And so I'm not going to read it line by line, but this person reached out saying that, you know, a lot of the advice and a lot of the podcasts that she listens to are from speakers, uh, are women who really initiated their divorce. And her situation's different. You know, she started out her marriage. They were madly in love. They were soulmates. They were married for over 25 years. They have kids together. And there were some toxic habits and behaviors that started to progress throughout the marriage. And then eventually um, he came to her saying that he had fallen out of love with her. And they did counseling, workbooks, retreats, all of that. But she says that his heart was not in it. So he initiated their separation. And, you know, it's a separation not only from her husband, but it's her best friend. Mm -hmm. And so... um, That he ended up with, right? Well, oh yeah, yes. She's now... I, that, exactly. So now she's lost her husband and her best friend. And now her husband, yes, is with an ex best friend of hers. So that's like an extra, God, ugh, yeah. extra, just kind of knife to the heart. Right. So, um, she's having a hard time. She's feeling sad. She's lost her soulmate, the betrayal, the fact that you know, someone that she loved dearly has stopped loving her. And so she would love to hear a discussion on this topic. So Mm. I thought we could tackle that today and just see where we get with that. Um, Just from this heartfelt space of inquiry and curiosity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's so many like different bubbles of I guess, thought and feeling that are coming up for me when, when I read this and when I listen about it each time. And it's like, part of me is like, you know, there's a few things here. 26 years is a long time. Yeah. It's a very long time. That's, that's a lifetime almost, you know, and to start out madly in love and often call each other soulmates. I, I, I believe that, you know, I believe that those words were meant and those feelings were real. 26 years is a long relationship. Like there's got to be some bond there, some substance that's, that, that holds you together for that long. So I really do believe that, you know, you weren't, because I feel like when this person wrote that, maybe they were sort of questioning, like, was that real? 
you know, we had yeah. this thing and now it's not there anymore. I've lost my soulmate. I've lost my, you know, my partner. Um, and so I just kind of, I guess I feel like I needed to affirm, affirm this person and say like, no, this, this apps, I believe it. I believe that. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And I think, I think that's not an uncommon thing. I yeah. think that feeling that, oh, it was all a lie. Oh, I must have felt something that the other person didn't feel. Like, I think those are common reactions and situations like this, um, where you feel like you, you loved for so long and thought you were being loved and you weren't. And I think you're right. There, there, there was love and really honoring that and giving yourself space to, to stay connected to that mm -hmm. um, and not just kind of throw that all away right? because of the pain. Right. That is the, that's like our go-to typically is like, oh, this is so painful. I, maybe it was all a lie, you know, and you yeah. kind of begin to like bargain and, and figure out like what, at what point did I not see this coming or, or whatever it is that, that, um, you go through when you have something this painful happen, but you know, I think like this was a living, breathing, loving, soulful connection. It was like an, an entity all its own. I like to say like it's two individuals that came together and they, they had this beautiful, you know, third entity that they were both creating together. And I think for 26 years fed it until one of the individuals could no longer feed it or it wasn't getting fed in return how yeah. they needed to. And so the loss of this is, is definitely like the loss of even a person, you yeah. know, it's, 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 it's like itself. a death. Right. Absolutely. And, but just because something dies, I feel like it's not worth honoring. Like you say, you know, and, yeah. and looking at and saying like, you know, because this is so painful, it just goes to show how real and beautiful it was. I don't yeah. know what are your thoughts? Yeah. And I think, I think exactly. And so I think that sometimes the inclination might be to like, do what you can to get out of pain, which might be pretend, you know, might be kind of buying into the story that it was never real or reconstructing the past to, to make yourself angry, right? Because it's so much easier to be pissed off and angry than it is to be sad and grieving, right? Mm -hmm. And I think I can relate to this a little bit. Like when I look back at my divorce mm -hmm. 10 years ago, gosh, wow. Um, mm -hmm. I remember being in so much pain that it was just easier to like be, be mad, right? Like I just started to like pile up all the awful things about him and like all the things that I missed and all the signs and, and granted that's a whole other conversation. There were those and mm. that's on me for not, um, you know, for not being present to that stuff. Right. Mm. But, but grieving isn't the time to kind of deal with that. Right. Like first it's like, just grieve, mm -hmm. right? Just, just cry, you know, just really allow the, the feelings and allow the, um, you know, it's like, you kind of want to like curl up in a little ball and like be yeah. nurtured and loved and just really kind of letting yourself cocoon. Yeah. Call in your support system too. Yeah. This is, I don't know how many times I had to hear this because I would constantly try to just isolate. And I think yeah. there's a time for that, but I, this phrase will always stick out in my mind. You do not have to grieve alone yeah. ever in any situation for anything where, you know, as human beings, I think we, we naturally grieve together. We can you know, especially like highly empathetic people. So you can feel pain across the world. Um, so take the time that you need to be in your grief 
and know that, you know, all you have to do is ask, ask for that comfort, ask for the, that support system to come in and sort of tend to you how you need to be. Um, it can be about you and your healing right now. Um, and you don't have to feel guilty f- about that. Even, I, I guess I'm saying this from, from a space also of sort of being able to relate to this. Um, cause this was an important piece for me when I was going through my divorce too, um, three years ago, it was, it wasn't for me that I initiated my divorce either. I want to like make that really clear. Um, I actually don't believe that I would have gone through with it if he didn't, if he hadn't made the final chop. Right. I was in such this place of like not wanting to let go of that entity that we created, even though it was toxic, even though it, it, it was unhealthy. Um, there was a part of me that it's, it's, I was white knuckling the last bits of it. Yeah. Um, I don't even know if I was in love with him anymore. I was just, that's, that was like the comfort zone was that relationship. Yeah. And I cannot imagine being in 26 years of that, having to, even though, you know, at the end, it, it ended up pretty tumultuous sounding. I mean, he, he left for the best friend, the ex best friend, um, emphasis on the ex, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like what a best friend. Right. Um, but you know, I think like, maybe the person that wrote this could sense inside themselves too. Like it's time to go. This, this, this relationship is over, but being so used to that, the comfort of it, that she's having a hard time, like just fully releasing. And maybe she's not, I don't know, but I definitely was when I was going through mine. Yeah, no, me too. And I think that, um, Yeah. It's like, I I think I wrote an article about this once. Like, is it really the person that you're missing? Like, is it love or is it an addiction? Right? Like, are you just, you know, the grief is there, of course, but like that, like that feeling of just my life's over, right? Like that constant craving. Is it really that, that there was true love there like healthy happy fulfilling love that was serving you and raising you up and and helping both of you you know live to your potential because that's love right I didn't know that then right Mm -hmm. I thought oh my god I love him so much and kind of the same thing like I initiated it but he kind of you know like who who did what I don't know but you know had he reacted differently, I probably wouldn't have gone through with it either. Um, but when I look back, I'm like, that wasn't love. Mm-hmm. You know, I thought it was. All of my whole being thought it was. I loved him so much that I did it in such a toxic way. <laughs> right? Like, yeah. I was codependent and I thought he was God and I kind of just gave him carte blanche on like all the decisions and even decisions about my own emotions and feelings and Uh, right. Like, and so I loved him that much, mm -hmm. right. But that's not love. I didn't love myself and I certainly didn't love him because you don't treat people that you love that way. No, absolutely not. You were like over functioning in his life and under function, under functioning in your own. Yeah. Did you, I'm curious, when you were going through yours, did you have a situation with a friendship that may have crumbled or anything? Because I definitely, I have an ex-best friend now because of my divorce as well. Um, But I'm wondering, because sometimes these things ripple, like our codependency, like can be seen in, in different relationships too. Yeah, for me, it was interesting because I had a very close group of friends and I got very self-destructive in a sense after. So I got so angry and I kind of held that all that emotion in so much that all the people around me, I perceived 
as not caring, right? Because I have an I'm alone story, right? So if they didn't like ask the right questions or reach out at the right time or not invite me to a certain party or like there was no way they could win. And so it was probably within a year that I like basically wiped my hands of almost all of my friends and really was just alone. Oh. And it's heartbreaking because, you know, there are people that I will never get to speak to again and never get to say I'm sorry to face to face. And, you know, there's those moments in your life when you really make mistakes that you can never take back. Mm-hmm. And that's part of being human. But what I can yeah. do now, what I do do now is um, I don't behave that way, right? Like I... I embrace conflict with friends. I make sure I extend myself. I make sure I ask the questions. I make sure I reach out and I don't just wipe my hands of people, um, Mm. you know, based on my own personal pain. And, uh, you know, I think that when you're in pain, you kind of start to rely on those old patterns, right? You just start to rely, go into survival mode, Mm -hmm. right? And like, you're not thinking and you're just acting and you know, it's probably the heart was the hardest time, one of the hardest times in my life, but it really brought to the surface all the stuff I had to work on. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. I could just feel that. Um, you know, I think it, it really is the best time to look at yourself when you're in this state of literally your life falling to pieces. Yeah. Um, I mean, relationships are relationships and intimacy is intimacy. It doesn't have to be in like a sexual way always. And so I think like when you're going through like an intimate breakdown of something, you be, it, it does spill out into like your best friendships and your family relationships. Um, just anyone that you feel close to, it's just sort of like, can I trust this? Yeah. And sometimes you just push away because that's easier than getting, than the fear of getting hurt again. Absolutely. Um, In this person's case, I mean, she's probably questioning like, you know, can I trust any of my friends? Did anyone else know about this? Right. Like if I didn't see this right under my nose with my best friend and my ex-husband, like, what else can I not see? Can I even trust myself? Yeah. So there's this whole like identity crisis happening too. Like, who am I? What do, what does my future look like now? Because the one I had imagined is apparently never going to happen. Yeah. Um, everything's different. I'm living in, you know, having a different living situation. Um, she has four kids that's going to be an exchange for the rest till they're 18 years old or whatever. And, um, so, and then on top of that, I don't know if I could even trust myself. Like that's just such a tough place to be in. And that is why for sure you need people who love and trust you or people who love and support you to remind you that you can trust yourself and to remind you that you're going to be okay and remind you that there's hope for the future still and they're not going anywhere. That's like, that's the time to really, you know, surround yourself and get your community to lift you up. And we don't know if she has community, right? So, you know, I know that I've had people reach out and say, I have nobody. I, I don't have anybody. I've lost everyone. Right. And so you know, I think it's, I think it's in those times and, and look, sometimes our bottom, you know, a bottom looks different for everybody. Mm -hmm. And, um, I truly believe that you get the bottom you need, right? It's (laughs) like my bottom was, I needed it. You know, I was, I remember my bottom. It was like two years after a year and a half after my ex and I separated and I was in a hotel room for two days, nonstop crying. And I thought, I thought I would never be able to stop crying. I thought that was it. Like I was going to cry the rest of my life. I had no, I just, and, but I needed that. And at that point, I just, it, it, I needed to feel so alone because I'd been telling myself that story for so long that I needed to really understand what that looked like. 
And so that I could be like, well, that's just not true then because I'm not like this all the time. Right. Like, and I have control over this. Like Mm -hmm. I have the power to get myself out of here. I have the power to recreate and to kind of go wherever I choose now, because this is, there's really nowhere else but up from here. Mm. So I think wherever that pain is, whatever that story is, whatever you're kind of repeating in your head, like I knew this would happen or see here I am again, or that's your story. And that's where you get to start making new choices and new decisions Mm. so that you can grow out of that. Right. Like, and so that this never happens again, like I will never, ever be in the situation that I allowed myself to be in ever again. Yeah. And that's not on him. That's on me. Mm -hmm. He was the catalyst, the the separation, the divorce. My gift, really. What a gift. What a beautiful, beautiful gift. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and you, with, with what you're saying about like, everybody gets the bottom that, that they need. It's maybe asking yourself, like, what is your bottom right now? What is that story that you're telling yourself? Um, not what is your bottom because it's hard to see it when you're in yeah, it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, but what is the story? What yeah. story is literally being manifested right now through the experiences that you're having? Yeah. Like what's, what's happening right now? You're, I, I hate to sound harsh, but you were left. You can't trust the people closest to you. Are these stories that you're telling yourself? Sometimes like, yeah. And do they you know sound I mean? familiar? Yeah. Do they sound familiar? Yeah. Are these, have you heard yourself tell these stories before? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my story was that nobody cared about what I wanted and that I also, if I actually said what I wanted and needed, that I would be left, that I would Mm. be like abandoned. Um, And that happened. Like it happened when I got a divorce. I needed support and the people in my life, my ex-best friend and my mother, they started manipulating me together with my ex-husband to try to get me to do certain things during the separation process. Mm. And I found out about it time after time. Like I literally found out about it 50 times and I would beg my mom, stop Mm. talking to them, please stop doing this. And finally it was like, wait a minute, this is my story. This is my story. Now I don't have a best friend. Now I can't trust my mother. My ex is, you know, extremely narcissistic, manipulative, does not have my best interests at heart, just wants to control me. That was my story. Everybody needs to control me or else they won't love me. Yeah. And so I needed to see what that really was like and to, to find out what I was made of, I think. Like if your worst fear, if your story has come true, what are you going to do about it? What are your choices? What are your lessons there? And that's the beauty of hitting rock bottom is that you actually see what's left. Yeah. I have a choice to choose to, to actually assert myself and to not be afraid of what people are going to think. I have a choice to not be manipulated anymore. I have a choice to draw boundaries where I need to draw boundaries, like mm-hmm. hard boundaries um, that maybe I was afraid to draw before. And, you know, I think, when you have a situation like this email with the, the best friend, obviously we don't know all the details and stuff, but the topic of boundaries is a really big one too. Like, it's funny because what I feel like this person needs to hear is like, you need support, you need to draw in your people, but you also need to learn how to draw better boundaries and assert yourself with the people that are close to you. Um, yeah, yeah. It's a good time. I always say like, there's a time for grief, right? Like you just got to grieve. You got to be held. You got to be supported. You got to grieve. Right. So, but the, and, and then 
the next step is really having the courage to get into the space of, okay, how was I the source of this? How did I co-create whatever it is I am looking at right now? Right. And it's just, it's like you were saying, like, maybe I was not setting boundaries. Maybe I was not voicing my opinion. Maybe I was isolating myself. Like what are the ways I was showing up in my life that I contributed to where I'm standing right now? Because that is where you then can say, okay, if I'm never going to have this happen again, if I'm going to transform my life, if I am going to transcend all this stuff, Mm -hmm. then, okay, if this is how I was showing up and this is what I've created, then I need to make adjustments. Okay. I Mm -hmm. need to set boundaries. I need to voice my opinion, my feelings, my needs. I need to tune into my intuition and trust it. Right. Mm -hmm. Like there's so many ways then that you can shift your behavior because at the end of the day, I think we've kind of said this before, you have to Nike your life. You have to mm-hmm. just do it. Mm-hmm. You do that through action. It's action, action, action. Nothing mm-hmm. changes unless you take action. Yeah, 100%. And I, I guess what we're also, what sh- this person's also dealing with too is like, because I think for us and me, I know for sure, but you have a child But for me, I was allowed to really, that process seemed quick for me because I didn't have anyone else to take care of. She has four. And it's just like, so the grief process could take a long time. Yeah. And you could feel bitter and resent for a while, resentment for a while. And you could, you know, not come to a place of finally being ready to ask yourself, like, how did what was my part in this Yeah, for a long, maybe you're not ready for that for a while. Exactly. Um, the priority is, you know, the kids, but I guess I will say from like a, a child of divorce uh, perspective, because I don't have children of my own through that process. Maybe you can speak on that part, but um, my father left my mom for another woman And I never forgot about it because my mom was so adamant at reminding me. Mm. And it really, it really had an impact on us kids. um, And the, our understanding of like, well, what about our feelings in this right now? Is it all about us having to take care of mom and her emotions while she's in this process? Or can we, do we have space to be sad too? Is anyone going to ask us how we're doing? Or do we always have to like, chastise our father you know what I mean so it's yeah it's a it's a really like I know that there's a lot of layers here um but I guess some piece of advice that I can give just from like that perspective of being a child of that is um be gentle with your children they're lit their their home is 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 breaking apart Mm -hmm. and you know although that pain is so, so sharp and real for the mother. It's real and sharp in so many different ways for the kids. And they, you know, they still probably love their dad and always will. And so just to like, remember that they need to be grieving too. They need their support, which Mm -hmm. comes in the form of their parents (coughs) only. Like kids support systems are their parents. So like a conscious effort, I think to, hold space for them is vital right now. Yeah. And they're very intuitive. You know, they're, they're more intuitive, I think, than most adults because they haven't been, you know, societalized. (laughs) But I remember early on, um, probably like a couple years and my son was very young. So he must've been about four and we always talked about feelings and made, you know, I really made sure to, to really be very conscious about the way that this all emotionally, we kind of processed everything. And I'll never forget at one point he was, we were just sitting, we were cooking and they said, are you feeling angry, buddy? And, Cause something had happened. And he was like, no, I don't feel angry. Uh, he was like, I, I just, he's like, I don't know. I guess I just feel sad. And I was like, okay. I'm like, well, that makes sense. He goes, but you're angry. And I went, 
what do you mean? He goes, well, you're really sad. He goes, but you're really angry too. And I was like, and he was right. Like I was, I remember going, oh my God. And I was like, you know what, buddy? I think you're probably right. You know, I think I am probably angry. I, I you know, and, and I was like, I guess I got to kind of look at that, you know, and, and we mm -hmm. just went on cooking and whatever, but like, that's how it's always been. Like just <sighs> there's space. And I wasn't bad mom for being angry or I wasn't anything, you know, and, and there was, there's just, we, I always made space for wherever you are right now, because there's no right or wrong, right? Like I might be feeling sad in this moment. He might be angry or, you know, like, but there's room for everyone. And I think sometimes when we're in pain, we expect all the people around us to feel what we're feeling right now. Like you're my best friend. You should be, I remember saying this to one of my best friends, you're my best friend. You should be just as mad at him as me. Right. Huh. Like, you know, and, and, and she was like, Oh my God, maybe you're right. Okay, fine. I hate him. Right. Like, yeah. but that's so not like she had her own stuff. It was her best friend too. She had her own grieving to go through that I kind of interfered with because I expected her to feel the way I felt. Mm -hmm. And I think we make that mistake sometimes. Mm -hmm. So really just giving everyone, and, and granted, I had one child. So again, like you said, she's got four different personalities, feelings, mm -hmm. you know, relationships to somehow make space for, but I think there's room for everyone in a yeah. really authentic and vulnerable way. I love that. And of course you're going to be angry. I mean, right. of course she's going to be angry. Of course right. my mom's angry. And, you know, of course we're all having our own experiences and our own, our own realities, you know, of like how we're understanding these, ex these experiences. And but I, I think, think what was interesting is, sorry, I don't mean to, but I think what was interesting about my son is I was trying so hard not to let him see the anger because I didn't want him to ever feel like he was in the middle or I didn't want him to feel like he had to be mad at his dad. Like I never wanted him to feel any of that. So in front of him, I was always, sometimes I would be sad and I was very um, like who I am, but I never showed the anger. Mm. but he could feel it anyway. He could feel my heart. So that's what I found. So they feel yeah. it, right? Yeah. So there's got to be a way to be honest about how we're feeling yeah. without putting it on the other person. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I love that, you know, it's, there's room for everybody. Yeah. Literally for everybody there's no hierarchy of, you know, somebody needs this more than this. It's, there's room for everybody. And with anger, it's interesting because that's something that as a society, I think we come to shame, right? Yep. Don't be angry. That means you're out of control. That means, you know, you're or that just means dramatic. you're sad. Yeah. That's yeah. just a cover emotion. It actually means right. you're sad, man. No. Sometimes you're just angry. Oh yeah. I think oh, like my, yeah. my therapist said, <laughs> cause I, I, when I was going through the divorce, I was like, you know, a couple months in and I go, I just, I, I think I'm angry. Like it was the first time I said that <laughs> sentence in my life. I think I'm angry. And she was like, you should be. Yeah. And I was like, Oh, this is natural. This is actually anger sometimes when we allow ourselves to experience it and, and have it just be expressed in healthy ways. Um, it moves us. It moves us to safer places. It moves us into action. Yep. And so to not be afraid of that, like this person should be angry if they're angry. Like that seems like a normal response and, and maybe it's going to be part of the fire that gets her into... Yeah. A life 10 times better, you know, or wiser or whatever. I think that's such an important distinction and highlighting that mm -hmm. anger is a motivator for change. Like if we didn't get angry, we wouldn't do anything, right? Like we mm -hmm. wouldn't, we wouldn't have the fire, the fuel, like you just said, to get out of wherever we are. It's a motivator for change. And when you can 
see it as that and focus that um, energy in, in, po- in ways that kind of move you. Yeah. It's like we, we get shamed for it, but it's, it really is a really powerful emotion. Mm-hmm. So powerful. So normal. So normal. It's, yeah, you know, and it's just like, how do you hold space for all of the things that are coming up? Like you're saying, like the time to grieve is now and maybe, maybe like looking up what are, what's the grieving process entail so you can know what to expect and what you can hold space for. There's, there's anger there, there's denial, um, there's sadness and acceptance eventually. And maybe you'll go back and forth on that scale, you know, over the next few years, but just to know that it's all normal. We're all, we've all experienced it, you know, or yeah, you're not alone and there's space for everybody. I love that. So yeah. 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 It's so hard because I mean, and I'm, I don't know if you're, I'm sure you're there, but like having gone through it and like just remembering how hard it was and how painful and how it just seemed like there was never going to be another side, right? Like it was never going to get out of that tunnel or whatever. And now looking back, it's like the thing that changed my life. It's like, I would, I, I sometimes I'm in just in so much awe and so much gratitude because I'm like, wow, like I had no idea mm-hmm. that I had this potential. Like I had <laughs> no clue what I was capable of. And thanks to that, like, thanks to him and, you know, and, and the divorce process and like just all of it here I am, here I sit, you know, and I'm still Mm -hmm. learning and growing and making mistakes and Mm -hmm. working through patterns and all of it. But like, Mm -hmm. holy crap, it woke me up, right? I'm awake. I am awake. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I 110% am like looking at you, looking at me, like the same thing. I feel the same way. Whenever you know, whenever we are in these moments of like being cracked apart, cracked open, we feel so scared and so small and so weak. And we're like, oh, now I'm, now I'm damaged goods. And ne- never am I going to be seen in this. I'm a divorced person. People hate divorced people. Yeah. I'm not going to be able to date anyone again because of that. I, you know, X, Y, and Z, this is why I'm going to fail in life going forward. And then you come out of it and you're like, I can do anything. Yeah. 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 (laughs) You know, you sort of are like, wow. So I, I got through something that I literally thought was going to break me forever. Yeah. And not only did I get through it, but I'm bigger and I'm better and I'm stronger and wiser and have more compassion. You know, the thing about being broken open is it causes expansion. Yeah. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. So I know it's easy for us to say on the other side of it, but yeah. But here we are saying it because I think it's important to hear. I know when I was going through it, hearing other people say like, oh yeah, I, I've been through a divorce and uh, I'm still here. It was like, oh, there's no shame in that person's eyes. Yeah. There's no shame in their voice. I don't have to be shameful of myself for going through this. And I can talk to people about it. Yeah. And I think on that note, mm-hmm. I think be really conscious of who you're speaking to. Yes. Right. Because you really want people around you who are holding space, but also holding the light, holding the high the hot, you know, the, the, the picture of what's possible mm. as opposed to the people who are like, Oh yeah, he's such a jerk. He's wrong. He's this, you're right. You know, like you're cheer, like you don't need cheerleaders, right? You don't need people keeping you is in your victimization, right? How wrong everyone is or how wrong he is. And 
you know, you, you need people who really can just hold the light for you mm. and the possibility and the people who are going to say, yes, cry on my shoulder. And then after you're done crying, we're going to reach for some light. We're going to reach for something higher together because that's how you get there a little, you know, sometimes it's three steps forward and then you fall back two, and then it's another four steps and then maybe you fall back one, but surround yourself with people who are constantly helping you strive for that next step. Yes. 110%. That's such great advice. I think because you will get the naysayers, you will get the people who are make you question yourself more than you're already questioning yourself. Yeah. So yeah, one, yeah, you have to make sure that the people you're being vulnerable with, you're being discerning about. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, Everybody does not deserve your heart. Everybody no. does not. Very few people actually mm -hmm. um, really should be hearing and, and, be gifted mm -hmm. with your heart. It's your yeah, heart. It is a gift. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we do hope mm -hmm. that this has helped the woman who wrote into us and anyone else that is dealing with a similar circumstance or, you know, just going through a, a difficult transition right now. Um, yeah. Yeah. We are very honored to be able to, to talk about this and to have been inspired to talk about this. Yeah. Thank you to the writer of this who brought this to our attention. It's a topic I think that's near and dear to both Jen and I. And so, yeah, it's very, very honored to be able to, to explore and to, to share freely, you know, what, what we think, our experiences, and um, yeah, thank you for showing up and being vulnerable so that we can help other people who are listening too. Yeah, absolutely. Any questions or follow-up or opinions? Again, we really, really value um, all of you and just appreciate your voice in this conversation too, so. Thank you, Deep Chatters. Thanks, Deep Chatters. Till next time. To all you Deep Chatters out there, Leah and I want to thank you so much for listening. This is a podcast that's all about connection, so we'd love to hear from you. Connect with us on Instagram at Deep Chats Podcast. And if you haven't already, please go to iTunes to rate and review us. Every review helps other deep chatters just like you be able to find this podcast.